the Meadow Rush is well underway, and day three of the games offers a full slate of competition on several fronts. The U.S. women's basketball team, under the guidance of Coach Kay Yao, will make its debut. The American players will open defense of their Olympic title by going against Czechoslovakia. You'll see that live, and you'll also see Greg Luganis. He'll make his first appearance of these games on the three-meter springboard. Luganis swept men's diving in 84. Now he's trying to become the first man to win the diving double. You'll see some potential stars in swimming. 17-year-old Janet Evans in the women's 400-meter individual medley final, and a great matchup in the men's 200 freestyle. Matt Bianchi going against world record holder Michael Gross. You'll see volleyball, too. Live coverage of the American men going against the Netherlands. Ducks are coached by Eric Sellinger, who in his last Olympic appearance in 1984 guided the American women to a silver medal. And you'll see gymnastics. The women's team competition will get underway with the compulsories, and the Romanians, defending world champions, will show off a spectacular crew led by Aurelia Dobre and Daniela Silibas. All this and more live today on NBC's coverage of the games of the 24th Olympiad. Korea on a foggy, muggy Monday morning. There's a 70% chance of rain later today, but that should not dampen the spirit of the athletes here. We're into our second full day of Olympic competition. And good evening. Welcome to our coverage of the Games of the 24th Olympiad. I'm Brian Dumble. I'll be your host for the next four and a half hours of live coverage from Seoul. It's morning here, just after 9.30 on a day when two American swimming stars will go for their first gold medals of these games. Tiny Janet Evans swims today in the 400-meter individual medley final, and Matt Biondi goes for the first of a potential seven gold medals. Our coverage this morning comes to you again from Olympic Park, where the swimming will be held, and where the gymnastics hall will feature the women's team compulsories, including live coverage of world champion Romania. Now, before we get to any of that, we'd like to catch you up on some Olympic news, because we've got some from here. American boxer Kelsey Banks, the world champion in the featherweight class, suffered a stunning knockout at the hands of the Netherlands, Regilio Tour, one minute and 50 seconds into the first round. Banks, in the blue trunks, got caught flush, and he fell heavily to the canvas. According to a U.S. boxing spokesman, he was unconscious for more than a minute. Kelsey was admitted to a local hospital for observation. When we spoke to him late last night in his hospital room, he was awake and alert. The first world record of these Olympics was set in weightlifting's 52-kilogram class. That's the little guys. Bulgaria's Sevdaly Marinov, all 114 pounds of him, lifted 120 kilos. That is 264 pounds in the snatch on his way to winning the gold. In other news, although track and field doesn't start for four days now, there's already controversy. American Carl Lewis, hoping to repeat his four gold medals of 1984, reportedly blew up at U.S. track coach Stan Huntsman. Lewis has been frustrated by the crowded practice facilities here in Seoul and by the constant hounding from the media. He even has threatened to leave Seoul to continue his training. USOC officials are, of course, downplaying Lewis's outbursts. We're getting close to the start of today's competition. Let's go out to the Olympic Gymnastics Hall, which is somewhere out in the fog behind me. My colleague Dick Enberg is standing by. It's evening where you are, but, good, but a good morning to you, Dick. And the same, Ryan. It is foggy, but mighty clear for the Soviets and the men's side because they lead in the team competition, have the top three individuals after yesterday's day one of that. The center stage belongs to the women today, an important three mighty big names in the sport. The women that uh, have gone uh, through the first name, the Olgas, Anadia, and uh, the Mary Lou. The rivalry today, and we pretty much uh, we will be talking a lot about it. It's like going to this old print. They have the name for Romania, Susanova for the USA, number one. That would be Phoebe Mills, the national champion. And we're talking a lot of them. But how about some long shots? You know, we really didn't know much about Mary Lou or not. What were they hit this garden? Here's one uh, thought. How about the USSRs? Natalia Lashenova. She's just 15 years old. Four feet, eight inches, 80 pounds. But don't be fooled by her size. She's incredibly powerful. And she has that quality that attracts audiences. She's caring for USA. We are losing from uh, just outside Andal, Florida. Under 100 pounds. Got a brother that went 220, a football player in high school back there in Florida. Named after the popular song of the 70s. Kay Yao came to basketball coaching almost by accident. It is no accident, however, that she's become one of the top coaches in all the world. 
She prides herself on developing good people as well as good players, and she knows what it takes to win. And she's fond of saying all it takes is all you got. Let's spend a moment in time now with Kay Yao. Registration day at NC State. Not for classes, but for Kay Yao's basketball camp. Her 15th summer conducting a camp, a place where young girls can shake the hand and receive the wisdom of America's women's Olympic basketball coach. The idea of coaching never occurred to Kay when she was a high school player. She actually stumbled into it in 1964 when she applied for a job as a high school English teacher and was told the teaching job was hers if she would also coach the girls' basketball team. I found out when I started coaching that I could help people grow more as people. The potential was greater to do that through sport than through any other subject to me in the curriculum. And I couldn't believe it because the total person is involved in sport. Like emotionally you're involved, intellectually, physically, spiritually, socially. The total person is involved in sport. That initial discovery led to what is now a highly successful 24-year coaching career and a philosophy for every level of the sport. Keep the thumbs more up. I told you it's going to feel a little awkward. My thing with my players has been to develop a genuine product, one that will last a lifetime with the characteristics and qualities to be a success in whatever they do. It's her philosophy and passion for the game that have won her national recognition. In addition to the honors earned as head coach at North Carolina State, she's also coached several U.S. teams, including back-to-back -back victories in 1986 against the Soviets at the Goodwill Games and World Championships in Moscow. The first time in 29 years the Soviets were beaten at home. Shortly after she returned, she was named the Olympic coach, and in preparation for the tough training and multiple road trips ahead, she decided to have a physical, only to discover that she had breast cancer. I was shocked. I was stunned. I couldn't really conceive of it because I felt great, and I, ha I did not have a lump in my breast. This was found through a mammogram without having a lump. Two weeks after she learned about the cancer, she elected to have a mastectomy. It was a time when she turned to her faith. I have a, a strong faith in the Lord, and I, I try to hold his hand as I go through each day. At that point in time, I was squeezing his hand. Here in the cozy community of Cary, North Carolina, she has found peace with her faith and strength in her basketball career and a family of friends. At 46, she remains single, having chosen for now to commit herself to her career. Kay Yao, clearly a woman of conviction and great courage, a woman of Olympian spirit. At the Chomshill Gymnasium, we're getting set for basketball. Let's join Tom Hammond and Nancy Lieberman-Klein. Thank you, Brian. We are ready for this preliminary round game, the first women's basketball game of these Olympic Games. In Pool B, the U.S. pool, as the defending gold medal champ U.S. team, takes on Czechoslovakia. Let's take a look at the starting lineups for the game, for the U.S. team and for the Czechoslovakian team. There are the Czech team, dressed in the blue. Uh, Novakova, one forward. Jana Sinova is the other forward. She's 6'2", 194 pounds. The center, Dubrovikova, is 6'3". And then in the backcourt, Kieselkova and Kalusikova. The United States will start with its most experienced lineup. And they will go with Katrina McLean, who was the leading scorer and rebounder in the Pan Am Games a year ago. Andrea Lloyd, 6'8", Ann Donovan, making her third Olympic team appearance. Teresa Edwards, regarded as the finest women's player in the world, and the point guard, Cammie Etheridge. Nancy, uh, the writers are saying this is the finest women's team ever assembled. What's your opinion? Well, I think when you talk about having the best women's basketball team, Kay Yao talks about having a lot of depth and experience, and this team here today has nine members off the gold medal winning team that won the world championships in 1986, so that's the most experience that we've had. 
the United States and the Soviet Union, the favorites to win the gold medal in women's basketball, and Donovan controls the opening tap. Andrea Lloyd out to Cammie Etheridge, who'll set it up. What about the Czech defense here? Well, the Czech defense is very aggressive and very physical, and they're going to give the United States team a run for their money, so the United States team has to board very well. Teresa Edwards got the pass from Lloyd in tight, and the U.S. breaks on top, 2-0. Full-court pressure from the U.S. defense. Point guard is Kaluzikova. Edwards with a steal. Here's the U.S. break. Teresa Edwards is fouled. Basket no good, but Teresa Edwards will go to the free throw line. Although Teresa Edwards made that steal, the pressure came from Cami Etheridge's defense. And here, Teresa was taking the ball down the floor, making a nice move to the basket. But she was able to get that first step by the defensive player from uh, Czechoslovakia. Eva Kaluzikova commits the first foul of the game as Teresa Edwards hits the free throw. She has all three U.S. points. From Cairo, Georgia. In fact, she lives on Teresa Edwards Street in Cairo, Georgia. And she learned the game of basketball by knocking the spokes out of a bicycle rim and nailing it to a tree in her front yard. She's now the finest player in the world. 4-0 U.S. lead. Shot no good by Jana Stanova. And a rebound to the U.S. Edwards, McLean. It'll count, and she's fouled. The foul is on Dubrovikova, and the basket is good by Katrina McLean. Here you see Teresa Edwards made a very nice no-look pass, and she put the ball into Katrina McLean, who did a nice little pump fake, and Dubrovikova went up and went for the fake. Here's McLean underneath. The leading score and rebounder in the Pan Am games misses on the three-point attempt. And rebounded by Czechoslovakia. Kieselkova on a wing. That's the first check basket. Matava Kieselkova makes it 6-2, the U.S. We played about a minute and a half of this game, and a sparse crowd, primarily for the Czech team, it would appear in the early going. Katrina McLean goes up again and draws another foul. It's on Janice Tanova, her first, number three against the Czechs. Anytime the United States team gets down into the half-court offense, you'll see them looking in immediately for the post players because they want to establish that inside game and draw some fouls on the bigger Czech women. McLean with the free throw. We mentioned that great Pan Am performance in 1987, which included 30 points in the gold medal win over Brazil. Out of the University of Georgia, she has four, and the U.S. lead is 8-2. Novakova, out front to Kaluzikova, and Donovan with a steal. Donovan took it away from Novakova, and here's the U.S. again on the break. Andrea Lloyd fouled by Dubrovakova. U.S. leading Czechoslovakia, 8-2. There's Kay Yao, the U.S. women's coach. You wouldn't think she'd be the center of a controversy, but the Goodwill Games in 1986, she was. Well, apparently when she went over to Moscow for the Goodwill Games, she uh, smoked a few Bibles in her suitcase, and it wasn't until she was back in North Carolina and, and preaching one day that she told the story, and uh, all the people at ABA USA found out. Kay Yao has been the head coach at North Carolina State for 14 years and has won 291 games in postseason play with her team 12 of the last 13 seasons. Teresa Edwards at the free throw line gives the U.S. a 9-5 lead over Czechoslovakia. 16 minutes, 50 seconds left in the first half. Misses the second shot, rebounded by the Czechs. There's your score with 16.45 left. The United States team is putting so much pressure on the ball that it's very hard for the Czech team to get even into their offensive set. You can see there how they're disrupting their patterns and pushing them way out on the court. Teresa Edwards almost had a steal. Kieselkova 
Shot no good by Dubrovikova, but the Czechs get the rebound. Kieselkova outside shot is good. That's something that the USA team cannot allow to happen. When they the Czech team gets the offensive rebound, they cannot let the uh, girl just stand out there and shoot the ball. That's an easy 18-footer for them. Tammy Etheridge, the point guard on the U.S. offense. And Donovan, double team. Lost it for a moment. And a jump ball. Now an international play. We will have a jump ball. There's no alternate possession. And Donovan, quite a story. Out of Old Dominion, the first three-time Olympic basketball player in the U.S. There you see the rule on jump balls as far as international play is concerned. Jumping against Novakova, who's 5'11", is Teresa Edwards. Edwards got the tap, but the Czechs came down with the basketball. They have a chance to tie the game. Missed underneath by Jana Stanova. And a foul on the rebound. I believe they're going to call the Czechs Ivana Novakova for reaching in her first foul. The Czechoslovakian team is best when they get into a two-man type of offense where they can pick and roll and shuffle cut off each other but they're not having that opportunity as you saw here in the replay they were lucky to get the ball over on the lob but Zara Bukova was not able to put it in the basket U.S. leading Czechoslovakia 9-7 Teresa Edwards powers it up and they're going to wave the basket off they say no basket and they're going to call an offensive foul on Teresa Edwards that'll be her second foul the officials in this game from Australia and Japan, and the Japanese referee making that call on Teresa, her second personal. This is a tough play for Teresa Edwards because she likes to use her body a lot, and she needed to give herself a little bit of space before she went up for the shot. Novakova lays it in, and that ties the game. They got behind the U.S. defense, and it's a 9-9 ball game. And Donovan looks inside. Katrina McLean can't hit it. Wades in to get the rebound, however, and the U.S. sets it up again. McLean gets open and lays it home. Although the United States team made good on that last basket by Katrina McLean, Kay Yao wants to see them run in the transition more, and they're not getting up and down the court, and that's why it's only a two-point difference so far in the game. Katrina McLean, the leading scorer, she has six. Just under 15 minutes left in the first half. 11-9 the U.S. leading. Now the United States team went through a two and a half hour workout yesterday and I was very surprised they went that hard and that long the day before the game and I'm wondering if they are a little tired. Andrea Lloyd has fouled as she comes up court with a basketball and with 14.37 left the U.S. will be in the bonus. They'll shoot one plus one for the remainder of the half. Now this is a very good substitution for Kay Yao because not only did she have her experienced team on the court to start the game, but now she brings in her athletes, her real explosive gals that can run the floor and make a lot of things happen with their creativity. There's the penalty situation in international play. The eighth foul, you shoot one plus one. Seventh in NCAA and the fifth of the quarter in the NBA. Andrea Lloyd hits the free throw. That's her first point of the game. Teresa Weatherspoon has come into the game for the U.S. as you look at Andrea Lloyd from Moscow, Idaho, played at the University of Texas. Also in the game is Cynthia Cooper and Bridget Gordon. So the U.S. getting plenty of fresh legs in the game with 14.35 left in the first. What's the U.S. team? Anytime the ball crosses half court, they're trapping the ball in the corners and they're trying to put a hand up on all the shots. Kieselkova misses. Here's Weatherspoon in a hurry. Knocked away by the Czechs. Kieselkova knocked it out of bounds. That's not a very good pass by Teresa Weatherspoon. She's on the left side of the floor and she's trying to throw the ball against the grain all the way to the right side. Weatherspoon to Cooper. Bridget Gordon looking inside. McLean trying to post up in there against 6'2", Jonas Stanova. McLean is 6'2", as well. There's going to be a check foul. Dobrovikova committing the personal foul. And that's her third foul. So Dobrovikova in early foul trouble. 
the Czech center. Tom, this is where the U.S. gets into a lot of problems because they do not have a very good outside shooting team on the floor, and they're not able to open up for Katrina McClain on the inside or for Cindy Brown, and they're going to have to pick the ball up just to give them that type of freedom underneath there. McClain misses the free throw. She's 2 of 4 at the line. Reaching in foul committed by Cynthia Cooper of the U.S. with the U.S. leading 13-9. Even as we watch the U.S. women's basketball team getting underway, let us keep you apprised of a score. In volleyball, the U.S. men today are taking on Holland. They're in the first of their best of five sets, and the U.S. men are out in front by a score of 9-4. to four. Let's go back to Chomshill Gymnasium now. Tom Hammond, Nancy lieberman Klein. Thanks, Brian. We have 11.53 left in the first half. The U.S. with a four-point lead, 17-13, over Czechoslovakia. And Nancy, an interesting thing here, the uh, Czech coach, who is Jan Karger, has elected to leave his starting center, Erika Dobrovakova, into the game with three personal fouls. In fact, she's just now going out of the game, but it brought up an interesting point last night. The Soviet Union, in its game against Yugoslavia, left one of its starters uh, in the game with three and then four fouls in the first half, and he eventually fouled out in the first half. That was uh, Volkov, one of the starters, and uh, the European team stay with them with fouls. In international basketball, it is so hard to get players in and out of a game that the coaches really have to be on top of the situation. Cindy Brown lays it in and draws the foul as well. Cindy Brown, who set an NCAA record by scoring 60 points in a game against San Jose State when she was on the Long Beach State Club, will try for the three-pointer. Cindy Brown is a very explosive player, but you hit. Teresa we Weatherspoon made a real nice pass into Katrina McClain, who went baseline. No look pass, and Cindy did the smart thing, rolling right to the basket. Eva Krizova committing her first personal foul as Kay Yao talks to this team. What are the strengths and weaknesses of this U.S. team now as we're seeing them for the first time in these Olympic Games? Well, I think the main strength of the United States basketball team has to be their pressure defense, their transition game, and then their half-court offense. Their glaring weaknesses are they're not, they are not great passers, and they're not great outside shooters. Susie McConnell and Cynthia Cooper are their best outside shooters, and I think that, in the long run, could hurt them against teams that pack in a zone underneath. Nancy, as a former Olympic player yourself, it seems that they're dedicated not only to winning the gold medal here in Seoul, but also to popularizing women's basketball with the fans back in the United States. Do you get that impression? Well, Tom, I think a lot of people have to understand with no Women's Professional Basketball League and only the Olympics and college basketball as our showcase, this is very important for the players right now to let people look at us and say they're great basketball players, they're very good athletes. So this is very important to all the players out there. They're not only representing themselves, but women all over the world. The United States getting to the line much more frequently than Czechoslovakia, getting the ball inside against a bigger Czech team and drawing the fouls as Cindy Brown completes the three. Very distracting to an offense. Berzikova makes a move to the basket and draws the foul on Weatherspoon of the U.S. That's her first personal foul and on the U.S. team number seven. Teresa Weatherspoon won the national championship with Louisiana Tech in 1988. She won the Wade Trophy as the collegiate basketball's best basketball player. Very successful career at Tech, and she comes out here, makes the U.S. team, and they say she's one of the most tenacious defensive players. Zora Berzikova hits one of two at the free throw line. It's 2014 in the U.S. Just over 11 minutes left in the first half as the favorite U.S. team takes the court for the first time in this 24th Olympiad. Cindy Brown being battered around a little bit but manages to hold on to the basketball and get it back out to Weatherspoon. Pretty moves the basket by Cooper, but the basket won't go on the second time she gets it there. One of the great things about Cynthia Cooper is not only is she a fun athlete to watch on the court, but she can go to her left or her right, as you saw in that left-handed scoop shot that she missed, but she was able to follow it and put the shot back up. 
Here's a U.S. foul on Cynthia Cooper, her second, as Kiesel Kova made a move to the hoop. And that is the third foul, excuse me, that's the third on Cynthia Cooper. There's Susie McConnell who comes into the game for the U.S. team at point guard, and she's got her own private cheering section here today. Susie's mom and dad, Tom and Sue, are here. Three sisters, a brother and her boyfriend, and all wearing Susie McConnell T-shirts. They got the group rate on that they had so many here on the T-shirts. Well, they probably bought them in Itaewon where everybody goes shopping. Novakova with the shot. She has nine points to lead the Czech team so far. As the U.S. turns it over, Weatherspoon can't handle it. 22-16 with 10.05 left in the first half. What about the pace of the game? Which team does that favor? I think right now the pace of the game is definitely favoring the Czechoslovakian team because they're doing a nice job of using the clock and the less time the United States has to run their fast break in their transition game. Susie McConnell commits a foul, and the Czech team will shoot one plus one. Eva Kaluzakova will be at the free throw line, and back to Susie McConnell and talking about the pace of the game, it seems that it moves up a notch when Susie McConnell comes in. Well, Susie's very good at pushing the ball up the floor, and she has very good court vision. So anytime you're filling the wing, she knows to get the basketball to you. Kaluzakova connects on both free throws. It's 22-18, the U.S. leading. 9.50 left in the first half. Weatherspoon to McConnell. Passed it inside through traffic to Gordon, and it comes back out to McConnell. Tried it on the other side and bounced it out of bounds. There's a U.S. turnover, and the Czechs will have it with 9.38 left in the half. You can see the Czech team is just packed in a zone, and they're, they're saying to the U.S., we dare you, shoot the outside shot. That's why Susan McConnell's in the game. She's going to have to put up a few outside shots. Dubrovakova, the starting center for the Czechs, comes back in. Remember, she's playing with three fouls. There's a block by Cindy Brown, and the U.S. has it knocked out of bounds by Czechoslovakia, with the U.S. leading 22-18, 9.23 left. NBC Sports presents the games of the 24th Olympiad. Here's your host, Brian Gumbel. Back in Seoul, we're continuing to follow the progress of the U.S. men's volleyball team. They have already won the first of their five-set affair against Holland. The final score in that was 15-7. to We'll be catching up on some of that action a little bit later. Right now, let's go back to the Chomshil Gymnasium for the U.S. women's basketball team proceeding against Czechoslovakia. Once again, Tom Hammerman and Nancy lieberman Clark. And Bryant, the Czechoslovakian team, has taken the lead. The free throw just made by Eva Krizova. And it's 26-24. Czechoslovakia has taken the lead on the U.S. The U.S. had a seven-point lead earlier in this half. But the Czechoslovakians have gotten a three-point basket and some inside play as well and have come from behind to take the lead. Jennifer Gillum, out of Ole Miss, was injured a few moments ago and had to leave the game. The United States team is not following Kay Yao's game plan. They're trying to take it one-on-one -on -one right now. Somebody's trying to get it going for the United States team, but it's not happening like that. Dubrova Kova. Baseline jump shot is good. By Berzikova. Zora Berzikova has come off the Czech bench to pick up five. And the Czechoslovakians go up 28-24. Teresa Edwards from 16. The U.S. has just gone cold. McLean can't hit the follow on the floor to the Czechs. Novakova leads the break. Shot no good. Batted around. Second shot. Novakova got it. The Czech team right now is just out hustling the United States team on the offensive boards and on the defensive boards. And if the U.S. doesn't get rebounds, they can't start their fast break. Kay Yao's team once leading by seven, now trailing by six. Dobrikova has just committed her fourth personal foul. So the starting Czech center in foul trouble with six minutes left in the half. Here, Teresa was coming down the right sideline, and she was making a nice spin move. Dobrikova doesn't move her feet. She slaps with her hands. That's a definite no-no. 
and that's a fourth foul. Kay Yao of the U.S. has called a timeout. As you see, Dobrakova, who just picked up her fourth personal foul with an even six minutes left in the first half of play. She's only scored two points. 6'3", 185 pounds, and the starting pivot man for coach Jan Karger. We said the pace of the game uh, probably would be to the U.S.'s benefit if they kept running, and we saw during one of the timeouts a couple of the Czech players sitting down on the court, but they don't show any signs of fatigue when the ball goes back in play. It could be a case that the United States team has play they played for three months, Tom, against themselves and against men's teams, and they come here at their first Olympic game. They might be a little nervous, although they seem to be very loose and confident, but they're not running their offense, and they're not getting into their transition because they're not getting on, on the boards and they're not getting the rebound. The U.S. has had some good shots, but of late unable to connect and only hitting seven of 21, while the Czechs are hitting 12 of 23, over 50%. The United States team looks very uncomfortable in their half-court offense because they haven't been pressured to play that in so long a time. The U.S. staying in the game at the free throw line. Athlete of the year, Teresa Edwards, ready for her second free throw. She missed it. On the floor, and the U.S. gets it back. Edwards behind the back. McLean, good. A play like that by Teresa Edwards could turn the momentum of this game around for the United States team. She hustled well to get to the ball and that nice behind-the-back pass to Katrina. And here's the trap in the corner as the U.S. closes within three. Cross-court pass, Berzikova. Novakova, she got it. The U.S. was applying the pressure, but Ivana Novakova hits for point 11, and it's a five-point Czechoslovakian lead. There's no movement on the USA offense. They're standing, and they need to move and make some cuts to free each other. All 12 U.S. players have seen action here in the first half. Teresa Edwards, double team, can't hit it off the glass. Bullet had it for a moment, and then it's taken away by Czechoslovakia. Here comes Kaluza Kova quickly into front court. Surprisingly, it's not the Czechoslovakian inside game that's giving the American team trouble. It's the outside game by Kisakova and Novakova. Novakova missed that one, but the rebound by Janice Tanova, and the Czechs still have it. 4.45 left in the half. Czechoslovakia leading the U.S. by five. McLean takes it away. Here comes the U.S. break. McConnell. Edwards. Pretty fast break. That's what the United States team has to do to get back into the ball game and take control of it. 32-29, Czechoslovakia. Less than four and a half minutes remaining in the first half. Here you see the two-man game against Teresa was just about to have a pick set on her. McConnell guarding Kaluzikova, who had the basketball. There's that outside shot again. It won't go this time by Kaluzikova. And the rebound by Bullet. McConnell to McLean. <laughs> Katrina McLean with 10 points. And the Czechoslovakians have called a timeout. That's their second and final timeout of this first half. 3.51 left. Czechoslovakia leads by one. <laughs> Hammond and Nancy Lieberman climb at the Chomshill Gymnasium with two and a half minutes left in the first half. And the United States trying to tie the score against Czechoslovakia. The Czechs leading 35-33 in a seesaw game. It saw the U.S. on top by as many as seven, and the Czechs have led by as many as six. Susie McConnell feeds inside to Katrina McLean and misses the layup. The U.S. continues to get good inside shots, but of late, they have not hit them. That's exactly right what you're saying, Tom. The U.S. has taken 17 shots in the paint. They just have not converted those shots. And that's concentration. They have to make those little chippy baskets. You think it's a case of nerves in the opening game? Here's McConnell all alone. Well, it rolled around, but it went through, and that ties it at 35. Sometimes when you're all by yourself, those are the toughest shots to make. 
Connell just released as soon as the ball went on the floor and she got the easy one. 143 left in the first half of a tie game. Novakova drives baseline. Wide open is Dubrovakova. She couldn't hit it, and the rebound comes down to McLean of the U.S. Bullet. She got it. It would seem to be just a matter of time because they are getting the good shots, and when they start to drop, the U.S. would seem to be able to take command. They lead by two, 37-35. Well, the thing that the Czech team cannot allow to happen is let the U.S. team get a run of 10 or 12 or 15 points, and then you'll start seeing a blowout type of contest. Well, there's a point in the paint for the Czechoslovakians that time, as the U.S. inside game has been the potent factor for Kayal. That time, Czechoslovakia's Janice Kanova got her first bucket of the game to tie it at 37. We're down to 47 seconds and a half. McLean misses in close and over the back for foul after missing the shot. Here you see Coop, she's looking up the floor when she's coming down. She sees Vicky Bullet. She puts a perfect pass there and Vicky caps it off with the easy shot. That was a pretty pass by Cynthia Cooper. But we'll go to the Czechoslovakian free throw line now after McLean's foul. She missed a little short jumper and then in frustration over the back of Dubrovakova. And Dubrovakova will step to the line looking for her fifth point of the game. She's a student. She's been a member of the Czech national team since 83. And Donovan, who just came in, knocks the ball away, but last touch for the Czechoslovakians. And with 41 seconds left, the U.S. has the ball. <laughs> Tie game. And a bad pass by Donovan. Nova Kova has it. And the Czechoslovakians can hold it for the final shot. Let's see if they do. And Donovan shouldn't have been receiving the ball 22 feet out underneath the basket. At six foot eight, she should be right in on the paint, down on the block, calling for the ball. That was the fifth turnover for the U.S. And here's a foul by Ann Donovan. So Donovan compounds the mistake of throwing the ball away by committing a foul with eight seconds left. You don't expect that from a 26-year-old who's been a member of three Olympic teams. All right, well, just as I was getting on Ann Donovan, they say the foul was on Cammie Etheridge. So sorry, Ann. Well, as Cammie went around the screen, she just pushed off a little bit. We're up high at the Chomshill Gymnasium across the floor from the official score, and sometimes it's guesswork on the personal fouls. Dubrovakova hits the two free throws to give the Czechs the lead. The U.S. will get one final shot. Etheridge to Edwards. Two seconds left. And the half comes to an end. Well, the U.S. came out, and the fans a little disappointed. Because they came out ready to play basketball, they had a seven-point lead. The Czechoslovakia got its act together, got its outside shot going, and climbed back into the game. The Czechs led by six, and the free throws just before the half by Dubrovakova give the Czechs a two-point lead at 39-37. So, Ann, what do you think about the U.S. performance here in the first half? Or, Nancy, I'm still on Ann Donovan. Well, I'm very surprised, one, that the United States team has come out, and they've been very sloppy with the ball. That's why they haven't been able to get into their transition, as we talked about. And if we take a look at the statistics at halftime, I think the Czech team has many more rebounds than the United States team does. Halftime here at the Chomshill Gymnasium, Czechoslovakia and the United States, with the Czechs leading 39-37. Let's go back to Bryant Gumbel. All right, Tom Hammond, thank you. As you can see, we've got a bit of a storm brewing outside here at the Olympic Park, and we've got a surprise brewing in uh, volleyball right now. We've been keeping you apprised of developments in that men's volleyball game between the United States and Holland. The U.S. men won the first of that best-of-five affair, 15-7, to seven, but in the second set, they are trailing 10-4. to four. And as we turn our attention to volleyball, the Olympics, of course, as you know, have a distinctly international flavor. Well, in a sense, volleyball coach Ari Selinger is representative of that all by himself. A German-born Israeli, Selinger coached the American women's team to a silver medal at the 84 Olympics. Now he's in Seoul coaching the Dutch men against the U.S. men today. Let's spend a moment in time with Harry Selinger.
Harry Selinger. He reminds you a bit of Al Davis with that just-win attitude. In 1965, he became the head coach of the Israeli women's team. A decade later, he took charge of the U.S. women, eventually leading them to an Olympic silver in 84. The ball. Wherever he's coached, he's been Go. successful, able to get his players to play above their okay. abilities. You have to come closer. This is a combination, so it's not a 41, it's 31. 41 is independent. Okay. He is, to put it mildly, a demanding teacher. The only person who is doing it right is Martin. Okay, approach, right foot, left foot, turn, fly with the face to the center, down, down. Up, up. And a harsh, some would say unreasonable, I don't like critic. what you're doing. You're taking your time to go to the ball, and then you have no time to set. I want you to be under the ball very quickly and time to set. But most of all, Ari Selinger is a survivor. I believe on April 7th, we were taken out of Bergen-Belsen. And we, put on, we were put on the train. They were going direction Berlin, I don't know, some dead direction. During the night, <clears throat> my mother heard some talk between Germans. What's going on? It's all the engine broke. Well, we have to do something with these guys. The Americans are closed. We have, well, tomorrow morning. So at that night, she took me off the train, and we went, you know, in, the train was stuck between two mountains in a valley, you know, there were swamps and so on. So we went off the train into the swamp. We were sitting inside the water in the morning, sunrise, all the Jewish people were taking off the train, you know, line up, and the Germans are counting them, and we're sitting very quietly in the water, you know, with my nose up, watching what's going on, and suddenly, we're looking up the hill, and trees start falling down in terrible noise, and we see tanks, American tanks, coming from up top of the hill down and destroying the trees. And immediately, all the Germans, I mean, about 60 or 70 of them surrounded, you know, surrounded, and we were released. I was uh, taken uh, by the Red Cross and uh, taken to Israel. And I was on one of the first boats, or maybe the first boat that came to to Israel in 1945, I think, July 45. Since 1986, he's been coaching in the Netherlands. Today, the head coach of the fast-improving Dutch men's team. Hired to get this team ready for a run at a medal in 1992, Ari is years ahead of schedule. And with his son, Abital, on the team, the trip to Seoul should be a relaxed one for this driven man. So, this Olympics, we go out there to enjoy ourselves. You see everything that you see because in the next moment we're going to work. Until you remember, of course, that Ari Selinger has a different definition of relaxed than most of us. And you see Ari Selinger on the sidelines now, his Dutch team now out in front of the United States in the second set of their best of five affair. Let's go to Han Young Gymnasium, Bob Trumpy and Chris Marlowe. Thank you, Bryant. Coach Selinger must be very happy. His team loses the first match to the U.S. 15-7. They lead the second game of this match, 12-7. Interesting note about Selinger. He does not understand nor speak a word of Dutch. Chris Marlowe, the story of game two has been the blocking of the very tall Dutch team. Well, it's kind of an upset in the making, just like the basketball game. It's really been a story of the Dutch overpowering the United States in game two. Eight stuff blocks, only two for the United States. United States starting to come on a little, but Holland in control at the moment. That was Steve Timmons, 12-9 the score now. The U.S. serving. You can only score when you serve. That's to Bertlick on the serve. Zojma. Postema. Benet. Kept alive. Ludis, the setter. Karai. Both teams, great defense. Ludis. Buck misses it. That's a Zwerber on the kill off Parch Karai out of bounds. And that stops a string of five unanswered points by the U.S. team. Number 10, Edwin Benet serves. He's 6'10. Karai. That ball is in. Side out, U.S. And Karch Karai got off to a very slow start for the United States, even though the United States won game one. Three errors, three kills, and eight attempts in this game. So Karch has not been spiking well, but he's starting to get his rhythm now. He's the team captain. 
He was the youngest member of the 1984 gold medal winning team at 23. Now he's the unquestioned leader. Karat. That's the one thing about Karch. He doesn't have to be spiking well to help the team. That time he just dribbled it in there as Craig Buck checks in for Troy Tanner and Sato checks in. Take one more look at this play. You don't have to hit the ball 100 miles an hour to get it down. Karai, just with a little off-speed dink shot, much like a changeup in baseball, puts it away. Sato at 5'11 with a jump serve. Nice block. It's off the block. Out of bounds. Side out touch. 12-9. The game is to 15. You must win by two. And Ron Zwerber serves for Ari Selinger's Dutch team. And a Back good one. Pass. They get it over the net, but it's a free ball now for the Dutch. Posting it. Off the block. That's the way to do it to the United States. Serve hard and block. Team averages Holland six foot seven. They can block the United States, but they must make the United States pass off the net. Wherever again, tough serve. Handled well. Karai. Simmons. And they fall over each other. Looney's couldn't get to it. It's now game point for the Dutch. It's ball. game two. U.S. won the first one, 15-7. It's the best of five in game. Door sets. Buck. Ludis keeps it alive. Subvertly. Karai. Through the block. Side out U.S. One big key for the United States, or even the Dutch, you must set the ball at least a meter off the net because the blockers are so big these days, if you set it closer than that, you're going to stuff it or get it back in your face. Wherever. Karai keeps it alive. Timmons. Oh, down the line. Point USA. Now 14-10. Netherlands lead. This Dutch team, the biggest in the history of the Olympics, averaging 6-7. Sato. Ludi. Timmons. It's up. Dozma. That's long. That's long. U.S. now on a run. Now 14-11. That's Mark Dumpy, the head coach. Jerry Sato, the assistant on the sideline. Ravers off the block and down. Side out touch. Substitution now for the Dutch comes in. Avital Selinger, the son of Ari Selinger. No nepotism here. Avital made the team before his dad was hired as the head coach. And he actually encouraged his dad to come over and coach Holland. He said, hey, Dad, we need help. Come apply for the job. And he got the job. And it really, uh, that was the start of the Dutch program's rise. The Bertley gets a kill off the block out of bounds. Side out U.S. Ricky Ludis, the setter, serves. He's from UCLA. Oh, Timmons taking advantage of five feet, nine inch. Avital Selinger dust it back in the court. Remember the other Dutch setter, Blanche, is 6'9". He would have had that. That's one of the big disadvantages of being small. Bene. Kept alive by Ludis. Nice dig. Oh! And a shank by Eric Sato. Just a problem. When the ball comes off the arms, it's wet. And that time, the ball just slid through Sato's hands. What you have to do in that situation, once there's a dig made, tighten up your hands. Get them close together so that can't happen. There's our high end zone camera. You can see the way the offense and defense deploy. Good digging by both teams in both games. Swerver, Karai, Ludi. Free ball here. Draper, nice block. Benet, that's long. Well, the U.S., not a team easily intimidated. A great deal of international experience. 11 Sato comes out. Doug Partey goes in. Even though they were down at one point, six points, they're back in this match, back in this game. Partey's played very well. He has five of the American stuff blocks, so he's played well at the net, spiking and blocking. Wherever, he is an absolute bomber for the Dutch. In their match against France, Wherever at 21 had 34 kills. Game point. Oh, big chance. Dozma gets it. The second game or set of the match goes to the Dutch. The U.S. win the first one 15-7. The Dutch win the second one 15-12. The teams change in. 
This is a play the United States was not expecting. No one up for the United States. Holland attacking in the middle, and give a lot of credit to the Dutch. They really outplayed the United States in game two. Harry Selinger admits that his team is preparing for the 1992 Olympics, and in that particular game, the Dutch had nine blocks, the U.S. just two. 1992, he said yes for a medal, but he told me that he thinks his team can do very well here, although he thinks he's a year away from having his best team. He only took over the program in 1985, and he came in and started training the team, and as he did with the women in 1984, he built that team into such a great powerhouse, and he did it very, very quickly. And he's done the same with the, with the Dutch men's team. That cheering section is provided by the Consulate of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. There in Busan, Korea, they brought about 50 students, and there that's the cheering section. And here you see the U.S. team exchanging jerseys. That's a little changing room. They have a changing room here simply because it is hot. The players sweat through the jerseys. You're not allowed to wipe up the floor. At least you're not allowed to have the officials wipe up the floor. And one of the players, Bob Stavrlich, number four, told me he has ten jerseys for this one match to change and go back out. I've never seen it where they have a... It's almost like a cabana. <laughs> a poolside cabana for the players to go in instead of stripping on the court they're changing jerseys trying to get dry it's a, a hot atmosphere although they do have the air conditioning on but when you're playing at, at, at top competition uh, very very difficult and you see buck uh, putting his jersey in the what do you call that a pool bag or <laughs> your wet bag i would call that the laundry bag <laughs> send it straight to the valet service numbers from the first game the blocking was exceptional for the Dutch. Well, that's the big key. The Dutch were able to uh, crank it down against the United States at the net. And uh, when the Dutch do that, they're the United States has to run their attack and make the big players for the Dutch move from side to side. If you keep them in one place, they're going to stuff it back in your face. You've got to move them from side to side. Make them run. Make the big boys run. Starting lineup for the game for They split the first two. That ball is out, hit the net. Oh, the side out goes to the Dutch team. Jan Postema will serve. And he serves into the net, which, by the way, is seven feet, 11 and a half inches tall, if you are interested. Now Craig Buck, one of the four members of this U.S. team that were playing in 84 when the U.S. won the gold. Dink. Ah, Dutch into the net. Tied out U.S. That's one of the rules in volleyball. You're not allowed to touch the net at any time. And you're not allowed to go under that center line. You can step on the center line, but not under. You can't go all the way over. U.S. makes the first point of game three. Karai, Ludies, Timmons. Good example, Bob, of the United States running a pattern. While this game goes on, we're going to show you a compulsory dive by Greg Luganis in order to give you action at two venues. We're still watching volleyball, and you're watching a, a compulsory dive for, by one of the, probably the world's greatest diver ever, Greg Luganis. It's 3-0, the U.S. leads in volleyball, and another look at the compulsory dive by Greg Luganis. This is in slow motion for you. Volleyball in real time. There's a spike down by Stavertlik. Side out U.S., they lead 3-0. There's the hand signal from the Dutch setter. He calls the offense. The setter like the offensive coordinator in football. An excellent score on that compulsory dive by Greg Luganis. And back to volleyball full screen, real time. And Edwin Benet now serves for uh, the Dutch. Benet at 6'10", 23 years old. 3-0, U.S. leads. Game three, it's the best of five. Stavertlik, Ludies, Timmons, right back at him. Ludies, Karai, right back at him, off the block. Side out, Dutch. They've split the first two sets, and the U.S. leads in game three, 3-0. Three this NBC Sports presentation of the games of the 24th Olympiad is brought to you by Coca-Cola and your local Coca-Cola bottler. You can't beat the field.
by your gas company and the gas industry. Gas, America's best energy value. By the American Express card. Proud to sponsor the United States equestrian team. Membership has its privileges. And by GE. From satellites to medical systems, we bring good things to life. Ten forty-four in the morning here in Seoul, Korea, and that expected rain has arrived. The only reason it has some relevance today, although most of the action inside the United States baseball team set to make its debut a little bit later on this afternoon at 2 o'clock is the scheduled start set to go against the team from the Republic of Korea. At Hanyang Gymnasium, the third set, the United States men are now out in front of the Netherlands by a score of 5 to nothing. But over at Chomshil Gymnasium, the uh, second half is already underway. Let's go back to women's back. Well, then she did Which half? See the shooting, Matu and the Czechoslovakian for the U.S. hitting only 39 percent in the first half. Berzikova committing the foul for the Czechoslovakians, and the U.S. sets it up. There's a bad pass and a steal. The Berzikova picked it off, and here's Novakova in front court.